Deep within the shadows of Montreal, a formidable force lurks, commanding fear and respect in equal measure. They are the untamed wolves of the underworld, the Rizzuto family, whose name sends shivers down the spines of even the bravest souls. For decades, this merciless mafia clan has held the city in its iron grip, orchestrating a symphony of crime that echoes through the streets. As they rose to power, they left a trail of blood and power struggles in their wake, claiming their position as the undisputed rulers of Montreal's criminal landscape. Join us on a perilous journey into the heart of darkness as we unravel the ruthless saga of the Rizzuto family, a tale of ambition, treachery, and the unyielding pursuit of power. Nestled within the vibrant city of Montreal lies a sinister underworld, where power is won through violence and alliances are forged in blood. The Rizzuto crime family, once an empire of fear and influence, held a firm grip over this secret realm. Led by the enigmatic Niccolo Rizzuto, they rose to become a part of the most feared and formidable criminal organizations in Canadian history. The Rizzuto family was founded by Niccolo Rizzuto, an Italian immigrant who arrived in Canada in the 1950s. Under Niccolo's leadership, the family became deeply involved in various criminal activities, including drug trafficking, extortion, loan sharking, and racketeering. The power and influence of the Rizzuto family reached its peak during the 1990s and early 2000s. However, their criminal empire faced significant challenges and internal power struggles. In 2004, Niccolo Rizzuto's son, Vito Rizzuto, was arrested in connection with a triple murder that took place in 1981. This arrest marked the beginning of a period of instability and violence within the Rizzuto family. During Vito Rizzuto's imprisonment, a series of attacks targeted the Rizzuto family's associates and allies. Many high-ranking members of the organization were killed, leading to speculation about a power struggle within the Montreal Mafia. These attacks were believed to be carried out by rival criminal organizations seeking to weaken the Rizzuto family's grip on power. Despite these challenges, Vito Rizzuto regained control of the organization upon his release from prison in 2012. However, his reign was short-lived as he died of natural causes in December 2013. His death left a power vacuum within the Rizzuto family, leading to further violence and instability. The detailed history of this mafia showed that Niccolo Rizzuto and his family packed their things and left Sicily for Montreal. He already had a job lined up, too, with the Montreal mob, at the time led by Vincenzo Vic Cutroni. Niccolo Rizzuto wasn't new to the criminal underworld, either. His wife, Libertino Mano, she was the daughter of Sicilian mafioso named Antonio Mano, and, according to the McGill Tribune, the mobster's connections proved beneficial in connecting Niccolo with the Catronis and other Sicilian crime families. This connection allowed Niccolo to form his own crew and make his own alliances outside the Catroni family, whose management he often disagreed with. He's going from one side to the other, here and there, he says nothing to nobody, he's doing business and nobody knows anything, complained Paolo Violi in 1976. Violi was Catroni's successor, evidently unhappy with the way in which Rizzuto conducted his business. In an attempt to resolve the ongoing disputes between Niccolo Rizzuto and the Catroni family, the Bonanno family, one of New York's most powerful crime families with ties to Sicily themselves, sent a group of mediators to deal with the problem. When no common ground could be found, the Bonanos sided with Rizzuto, sparking a war between Calabrian and Sicilian factions of the Montreal mob. Rizzuto quickly orchestrated the murder of Pietro Schiara, an advisor to Violi, and a year later, two of his gunmen shot and killed Paolo's brother, Francesco. Paolo Violi, however, was seemingly spared by his brief stint in jail, only to be murdered upon his release in 1978. By 1980, the Sicilians had all but wiped out the Calabrians. Paolo's remaining brother, Rocco, was shot by a sniper mid-family dinner and the Rizzutos had cemented themselves as Montreal's preeminent crime family. Then Niccolo Rizzuto handed the reins of his empire to his son, Vito. When Vito Rizzuto took over control of his father's empire, he was put in charge of a multi-million dollar organization at the forefront of Montreal's criminal underworld. 
The Rizzuto crime family didn't take it slow when it came to crime. They had their hands in everything from construction fraud, drug trafficking and gambling to money laundering, bribery, extortion and stock manipulation. Then, in early May 1981, Rizzuto was called to New York by a high-ranking member of the Bonanno crime family, Joseph Messino. Many cite this moment as Rizzuto's official induction into the Bonanno crime family. The Rizzutos were often referred to as the Sixth Family, but that wasn't the only reason he was called down from Montreal. At that time, the New York Times put out a story detailing the successful infiltration of an FBI agent into the Bonanno crime family. The agent went by the name Donnie Brasco and had been discreetly keeping tabs on the criminal organization since 1977. Not long after Rizzuto arrived in New York, Brasco caught wind of three high-profile murders within the Bonanno organization, Alphonse Indelicato, Philip Giacconi, and Dominic Trinchera. Three capos were gunned down in a nightclub in Brooklyn. An official complaint against one involved a mob member named Benjamin Ruggiero and read, For the past two years, bitter and increasingly violent disputes have arisen among the several capos or captains within the Bonanno family resulting in their split into two main factions, those loyal to the current boss of the family and those opposed to him. As the story goes, Indelicato, Giacconi, and Trinchera had been opposed to the Bonanno family leadership, so Massino orchestrated their murders and enlisted Rizzuto for the job, along with three other gunmen, including Massino's brother-in-law, Salvatore Vital. Although the Three Capos murder didn't yet spill the end for Rizzuto or the Bonanno crime organization, the event planted the seed that would ultimately lead to Rizzuto's downfall. For 20 years after the Three Capos murder, Vito Rizzuto seemed untouchable. He was the head of Canada's largest criminal organization, his illegal businesses netting him billions of dollars as he dined with politicians and other powerful officials. But in January 2001, Rizzuto's once impregnable empire was dealt its killing blow. A group of officers appeared at Rizzuto's home with a pair of handcuffs and a warrant for his arrest. It was surgical, Nick Milano told The Sun. Milano was one of the officers tasked with surveilling Rizzuto and ultimately putting him behind bars. Mrs. Rizzuto opens the door and he's at the top of the stairs. It's not a small property. My partner and I asked him to come down. That's when my partner told him, Dress up nicely, Vito, because you're going to court. The Canadian police were able to bag Rizzuto in 2001, but it would take another two years for the FBI's extradition warrant to come through. Milano accompanied Rizzuto on his trip to New York and spoke to him extensively on the return trip to Montreal. He was forthcoming and spoke openly about his family, his prediction about how things would go in his absence, Milano said. It was prophetic. Everything except the murders of his crew and family happened. On May 4, 2007, Vito Rizzuto pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder in relation to the killings of Giacom, Trinchera, and Indelicato. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison and fined $250,000. But, as he told Milano, things didn't go well for his crew while he was behind bars. Rizzuto's absence created a power vacuum. And while the Canadian mobs fought for control, his family paid the price. In 2009, his son Nick Rizzuto Jr. was gunned down in the street. A year later, his father Nicolo was killed by a sniper in his home. Now battling lung cancer, Rizzuto was given early release in October 2012, but he was never able to regain control of his former empire. Instead, he reached out to Milano and gave him information about corruption in Canada's construction industry. Vito Rizzuto ultimately lost his battle against lung cancer in 2013. His criminal empire started shambling at the same time. However, the rise of the Rizzutos was fueled by an iron fist and a ruthlessness that knew no bounds. They controlled a vast array of criminal activities, including drug trafficking, extortion, and money laundering, ensuring their dominance over the city's illicit economy. Their reach extended beyond Montreal, making them a force to be reckoned with throughout the Canadian underworld. One of the famous professors of organized crime, Marcel Dennis said, they constantly replace themselves. They're quite strong, and as we can see by the most recent police arrests, 
there's still an alliance between the Hell's Angels and the Mafia. However, as the Rizzuto's power grew, so did the number of enemies determined to bring them down. Internal conflicts and external rivalries ignited a series of violent battles for control, turning the streets of Montreal into a blood-soaked battleground. The family's dominance was threatened by factions seeking to usurp their power, leading to a never-ending cycle of vengeance and betrayal. Revenge played a pivotal role in the Rizzuto family saga, particularly when it came to their conflict with the Calabrian Mafia, known as Indragheta. This bitter rivalry, stemming from past disputes and power struggles, set the stage for a deadly clash of rival factions. The line between friend and foe blurred as tensions escalated, and even the most powerful figures faced the constant threat of assassination. Marcel Dennis, professor of organized crime, showed his views by saying, there's a parallel there, and whoever shot Rizzuto was a professional killer. The gun was in the woods in the back of the house. He'd have to be a super shot to do that. When you look at who might have killed him, you come to the conclusion it was not a street gang. It was not the Hell's Angels. Law enforcement agencies were not only spectators in this battle for control. Recognizing the threat posed by the Rizzuto Empire, authorities launched extensive investigations and operations to dismantle their criminal network. Project Colise, a groundbreaking law enforcement effort, aimed to strike a decisive blow against organized crime and restore order to the city. The consequences were devastating for the Rizzuto family. Key members were targeted and eliminated, creating a power vacuum that attracted new contenders hungry for control. The struggle for dominance intensified as factions within and outside the family were fought relentlessly for supremacy, resulting in a relentless and bloody power struggle. Yet, amidst the chaos, the Rizzuto family's resilience and tenacity persisted. Their reputation for cunning and ruthlessness left an indelible mark on Montreal's criminal landscape. As a new generation of mobsters emerged, the Rizzutos fought tooth and nail to maintain their grip on power, refusing to let their empire crumble. As it is famous for them, somebody always takes over. Always. Marcel Dennis, professor of organized crime, Today, the legacy of the Rizzuto family hangs in the balance. Montreal's underworld continues to evolve, with new players entering the scene, each with their own ambitions and hunger for power. The future of the Rizzutos remains uncertain as their once invincible empire faces its greatest challenge yet.